includes large characteristics from different on-site detention facilities, also to establish a correlation between the usage and uh, the load of uh, between the number of users and the sludge quantity and quality, and also to provide useful data for improving the design, the sizing of pre packing devices, um, the transportation and processing systems for the sludge, and the design of future on site sanitation systems. Next, um, the pre packing program that has been followed, it's within Durban, uh, the EPP municipality. So we did a study on a number of uh, different types of on-site sanitation facilities, um, household uh, VIP latrines which are dry or wet, um, urine diversion toilets, unincorporated latrines, community pollution blocks, which are also VIPs and school VIP toilets. These are the regions around the EPP municipality, and we selected, uh, we tried to Select samples from um, different numbers of facilities, trying to keep um, low and high use, um, respectively under or over five users per household. So, to start with the selection of the samples, we go through that it doesn't make sense just to go and collect random samples. So that's why we tried to, um, to follow a sampling method that we developed, um, which um, it's not probably the most of you know how the pig look like. And the sludge is very heterogeneous, has different data, um, also the different types of pigs are uh, having different designs. But however, we tried to follow a similar way of sampling. Uh, so if you see there's the sludge, uh, these are the different points where the sludge has been collected for the different types of on-site sanitation facilities. Um, when we, uh, we had the help of um, manual pit engineers, so they would take different layers of the sludge and then we would select um, small samples which we would bring to the pollution research uh, group laboratories and we would analyze them from different properties. So this on the left is um, how we selected samples from um, from dry VIPs. Uh, I'm going to pass quickly to the rest of the, the types of facilities. I'm not going to speak about the sampling. We have a workshop happening on Thursday. Um, it's uh, about uh, it's in room number four. So please have a look at the program if you have more interest. Um, how we select samples and um, yes, uh, we can give you a lot more details. So this is um, a wet EAD. Just wanted to make sure that you understand what's the difference between wet and dry and how we classify it. We had questions before. So the, the wet one was full of liquid, and actually this was the sludge crust covers on top. There. So one, two, three were just the samples collected from from the sludge. All the rest was liquid. We collected some samples for analysis too. Next, um, school toilet, um, again VIP, but obviously the the usage was not this high, uh, or particularly from that school we collected the samples from. So we had a shallower sludge level, so we couldn't select eight samples. We collected an average four from each week. This is a uh, green diversion toilet. <laughs> again, we had double point four system. Uh, one of the previous talks earlier today. So the active mode is where the users uh, uh, use the use the pig for um, uh, for uh, eco matter. Um, the other inactive mode is the one that has been uh, used uh, previously, has been cool, um, has been filled up, then the pedestal has been moved to the next one, and then this one was aging while the other one. We collected some samples from unimproved pickle trees. Um, the results I'm presenting are from um, actually pits uh, that uh, haven't, been, uh, hasn't been, haven't been used for a while. Um, we didn't know the exact time that uh, they, they stopped using them. Uh, we were not allowed to destroy their uh, unofficial toilets, so we couldn't take uh, fresh samples from this type of pit. 
so to move on the <coughs> to move on the analysis we have performed, just wanted to make a point. We we passed already. Uh, I think it's mostly covered during most of the presentations. We have a lot of non legal material in the bits. Um, I didn't see this in India, for example, in the bits we went to visit, but then um, in the context of um, South East Africa, this is a major problem. So that's why we wanted to understand what is the ratio between organic or fecal matter to the non fecal matter. So we did a characterization of a number of facilities. That's how they were just trying to try to follow a procedure. And so these are some examples of the different types of uh, non-fecal materials we found. Menstrual products, plastics, paper, hair, um, some other textiles. So that's the outcome of uh, this study. So we did analysis on um, samples from five um, different bulbs or pigs. Um, active, non-active, um, uh, urine diversion toilet, um, urea, uh, high <coughs> UV, uh, only one with a tree, one and another one. So this is the moisture content of each one of them. That's not 0 0.74, that's 74% of moisture content. So um, that's the mass distribution based on wet sample. We didn't have the facility to try such a large quantity of sludge, for that reason we did it just on a dry mass basis. So you can see that about 85 to 95 percent of the analyzed samples were represented by organics. Also there we have um, paper, which is um, half degraded. We couldn't separate it. Where in the cases where we could, we were separating it, but I'm assuming in this um, modalities there was some paper degraded to a certain stage. Uh, just to show you, this is the distribution between the different categories um, out of the organics, because in the other problem you couldn't see. So, paper, for some of them, we could distinguish um, textiles, woods, stones, etc. To move on the analysis, so as I mentioned, we, we have done quite a lot of analysis in our pollution research group, uh, laboratories. All these analyses, um, for them we have developed a standard operational procedures. We are going to speak about the protocols we follow again during the workshop. I'm not, I don't have much time left for that. Um, but these are the examples of what analysis we have done under this project and we have quite a lot more. So, for this presentation, I'm going to just show part of that because just it's impossible to cover everything. I'm going to show you about the moisture content, um, ash and volatile solids distributions, COD, pH. Um, just to mention, uh, probably there will be questions about TKA, pneumonia, uh, phosphates and orthophosphates. Lungi is still not all, um, in the same session. Um, so we will cover only part of them, if you are interested. Um, then other properties, like um, colorific value, thermal properties, mechanical properties. Um, so I'm just covering some aspects again. Um, colorific value, rheological properties, particle size distribution, and Pascal's process. I selected them because I know that there are quite a lot of partners with particular interest to these properties, but we've got all the data available. As I mentioned, we collected samples from different um, depth of the pit, but then uh, we are uh, not presenting the, the distribution between the, the different pits because Louis is uh, providing uh, this information later. What I wanted to show you here is that uh, what, how does it look the distribution between all the samples we collected? So, for example, that's the dry DIP, that's the number of all the samples we collected, um, um, samples, uh, that's all the samples we have analyzed. So, these are the different facilities, dry, wet DIPs, community pollution blocks, green diversion, toilets, school DIPs, and unimproved bits. 
text here is coming from uh, the wet samples, from, uh, sorry, the liquid samples, coming from a very wet bit. So these are the mean values uh, for each one then, just to show you where we are standing. Obviously when we have aged samples, uh, we have lower moisture content, otherwise for our DAPs, the average moisture content is about 80%, 80-25%. In Ash content, we have a wide variety again, and these are the main values once again showing um, certain distribution between uh, the different types of facilities. And just to pay attention, we, we express all the properties of most of them in grounds per brown dry sample, because most of the samples have uh, different moisture content, so in order to make a um, better correlation between them, we can express them in the dry sample. Brown dry sample. So. Uh, total COD, again, we have different distribution depending on the age of the sample, and depending on the layer the samples have been collected from the age. Um, calorific value, that's where the mean value is today. Um, these are the biological properties. Um, we analyzed quite a few of them. Particle size distribution, that's the mean value for one and the same sample. That's using a modern uh, particle size analyzer. That's uh, data from um, yeah, I'm finishing. Uh, that's a data coming from a poster uh, from Nicola Roder. If you're interested in the Helmix X, you can go and have a look um, and chat with her. Um, it's quite interesting. And that the conclusions obviously summarize um, the different distribution between the properties and the average values we have found. working for the WSP World Bank 
and she will be presenting an, ass um, an assessment of on-site sanitation system and sludge accumulation rate to understand pit emptying in Indonesia. Thank you.
Slash accumulation rate is calculated based on the thickness thickness of the sludge, uh, internal area of the tank, number of the people served by the tank or household occupancy, and the year since last emptied of age of the tank. We found that there was a wide variation rate, with the annual annual sludge per person accumulation typically ranging from 10 to 30 liter per person year which is within the range but on the low end of previous international findings. This is as expected with previous studies, finding lower than in wet pits and those without rubbish, different with the earlier presentations. Few systems with short accumulation time had very high sludge value We have influenced the mean value. There are some influencing variables, such as years of accumulation and research time. <coughs> the slash accumulation net was mostly affected by the duration of accumulation in the tank and the frequency of empty. The picture shows that accumulation rates are peaked in the first six months after empty and a reduction with years of accumulation. Previous study also found that a peak rate in the first year accumulation of two to three times average. We also found that the average accumulation rate for the first six months is 48 liters per person year and reduced to a constant average of 90 liters per person year for greater than three years storage and further reducing, reducing to 16 liters per year per person for very low storage. Never empty system has a lower slash accumulation rate at 14 liter per person year compared with regularly empty system at 41 liter per person year. The other reasons we found for the low accumulation rates include the system with the outlet parts, which indicate that some solids are discharging into the drain or the river and more likely to never be empty. And very small system with less than 0.575 meter cubic also have a low accumulation rate and typically have an outlet drain or river. The system access were installed in challenging environments such as high water and some having no sludge accumulation after two years, maybe too small to store the initial big slash rate, which we are looking for for the analysis. We also found the frequency of the empty that were added to the homeowners since we don't have, since the government don't have the record on that. Although the study has a preferred to system that meet empty to enable slash measure, Still, we found that almost 60% of the system have never been emptied for 15 years operations. However, after the system is emptied once, next emptying is required after the first two years. Therefore, at the first emptying, customers could be suggested to join a regular emptying program on evidence that they may require regular emptying from now on. We also found that regular emptying system has a very little sludge and mostly liquid. It is possible that soil calculations has become clogged and no longer able to infiltrate the liquid. The survey also asks the reason of the homeowners of asking the service of the MP. Almost the system was empty due to the toilet not flushing. And some also found, uh, some also called the service as a regular event, empty or prior to important event before a teaser or due to smell. Uh, and this is my last slide. So after we all having those data and information, what will we do next? Uh, and this is, will be the most important thing. The summary of the study, we found that most of the on-site systems are not a standard septic tank, and the 
instead a single rich field. So this is a generally uh, related with the poor understanding of adequate and appropriate concerns and ambitions, and also now establish responsibility for promotion and enforcing quality systems. And related with the uh, rate of sludge accumulation, it is recommended to use the rate of approximately 25 liter per person year, since it is reflected the site and climate conditions to Indonesian context to avoid oversized flood. And by knowing that most pits are never active, treatment plants should not be sized, assuming that 100% of population is empty, otherwise low flow causes operational issues. Okay, the government should consider a good promotional campaign for improved septic tank and need to empty tank. And actually we also have another result of relatively this one. We found that um, there are a willingness to improve from the community on improving their own sanitation sanitations and also the willingness to pay from them to improve their own sanitation. sanitations. However, this willingness to pay is not as high uh, so cannot bear all the costs that need to improve the, the on sanitation sanitations. Therefore, a subsidy may be needed or a financial mechanism also may be required. And by having the advantage on the system, fecal waste flow and containment are better understood and can be put to fecal waste flow diagram. And this evidence could be the basis for input for advocacy to the decision makers to increase the awareness on how is this critical condition of the environmental sanitation. And the last thing that we recommend is not related with uh, not all of the cities has the same conditions. Therefore, detailed data analysis of each city are needed. Thank you. Thank you, for this great presentation on the good practical aspects of how to use this data. I see many hands around. So, can we have a question there? Thank you. Hello. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation and very useful. This is Linda Strumming from Sunbed. I just had a quick question on one of your first or second slides. You said there's 150 sludge treatment plants. And I was wondering if you could explain for us exactly what a sludge treatment plant is. Is that fecal sludge treatment, wastewater, wastewater treatment sludge? Yes. There at the very bottom, over 150 sludge treatment plants. So you're asking about what is this last treatment plant is? Okay, so this treatment plant is only to, to treat the septage one. So this is uh, separate from the sewerage treatment plant. From the wastewater treatment plant that we had for our sewerage uh, network. So this is only for the septage treatment plant, which is based on the Ministry of Public Works analysis that only 10% which is now operated very well due to several reasons, institutional one and also the technical one. Okay, so the over 150 treatment plants only for septic tank sludge. Is that dry beds or settling tanks or for what type of treatment are they? Mostly are uh, dry beds. Okay, I'm sorry we, we tried to keep the time. And by the way, I figured out there was something like it because of myself. I'm Megan Vassal working for Ayabak Sunday. And it's now my great pleasure to announce Lars Schubitz, also working for Ayabak Sunday. Um, and he will present information about quantification of people sludge by truck mounting studies with the private amateurs association in Kampala. Yeah, thanks for me. I will actually stand down here, that's okay, because I don't really like to stand on the podium. Um, as Margie mentioned, this is my presentation. What I quickly want to say is that I'm very happy to be quite full. I don't know if it's the amount of participants that makes it, but it's nice to see. And it happens to be that this is the second international conference 
for people to start trying getting to go to that is in a place where I've lived. So we don't have a number four somewhere. It might not be it might be the whole town and all the journey, but the participants definitely outnumber the inhabitants. It was probably not in Zurich. We might have a problem in Swiss Bank. But it could be in Kampala, where I've also lived for a while. And this is what my presentation is about. And what I also want to show you guys is that on this slide you can already see to find a token from the Private Actors Association. It is not the abstract I paid for the clear reason that he has played a major role for us to take out the study. And this I will introduce all of you. So this yeah. That's actually him. Sorry it's a screenshot, but the internet wasn't working so well. So just to quickly introduce Jafari. And my presentation will cover three points. So I'll quickly explain what the tens of methods exist to actually quantify people sludge. More about that again on Thursday during our workshop. And where we even have some case studies and we'll try it out and we do some group work on that. Then what is the benefit of a truck counting study? Why should we actually do it? In which context does it make sense? And what to do before and what to implement a truck counting study with the existing example of the So how to quantify people sludge? And there are different attempts, and we are trying to define those and always having discussions. But at the moment, we are in three, and one is MS production. What we are saying is it estimates the future demand for people such empty and transport and treatment. Quite an important one, we need it for planning. We have a lot of discussions on how to do that. And this can be based on existing secondary data, baseline studies, sanitation master plan, etc. There's often something existing which lets us estimate the future demand for people such. And it's often done. It's often per capita production of excreta, sludge accumulation rates in septic tanks versus pit latrines, it's quite different. And it also includes population growth rates. So the second one would be fecal sludge volumes, or what we call fecal sludge volumes, which in this sense is um, the current demand. So it's the current of the future for fecal sludge emptying, transport, and treatment. This is a very resource intensive one. This actually means you are going to do baseline studies. You're going to the city and you're going to do all this work that other people have done for fecal sludge production. <coughs> and what this includes is like figuring out what are the specific sludging intervals of the people that are living in the city. Often they sludge different times. We can find like ranges from two to 10 years. All of that influences the current demand. What's the use of the system? What type of water enters the system? The dry pit, etc., the showering in the pit. Not in the pit, but in the construction. <laughs> then the construction of the system itself. How is it constructed? How big it is? Does it have any buffers inside the septic tank? Sometimes it doesn't. Well, it's not a septic tank that really, but that is important. The age of the system, the number of users per system, we find to be very important, obviously. And also physical properties, like what's the soil permeability and all of this stuff. So now number third, and this is what I'm going to talk about, is fecal sludge collection. And this specifically estimates the current amount of fecal sludge that is collected. So we're not talking about the amount of anything, but this is what is collected. But what we, and this definitely, um, so the study requires less resource intensive collection, but it's again primary data. And um, what it means is an existing local discharge location, where we have this very special case of Kampala, where it's very unique that we have a discharge location where apparently all three is just delivered to. It needs a cooperation with service providers, which I just introduced to you. It's also a bit of work. You need to like, get to know these people. You need to make them agree with you. You know, often it's like a bit informal, not formalized businesses, etc. So it might be a bit difficult to actually do that. And then you can perform the truck companies. So just a quick summary. Those are those three attempts. I'm going to talk about them a bit more on Thursday, just to keep in mind this is what I'm talking about. So why a truck hunting study? Um, so a truck hunting study can be performed. Huh? So to cross check existing data, maybe there are some records about it. So you can cross check the data. Maybe people have made projections, etc. So you can cross check those data. To gain knowledge about how much human sludge is currently collected, which I've already said, and now we're trying to figure this out. I hope this is not the Cool. And
And you gain an understanding about fetal cell origins. What I mean with this is like, is it coming from households? Is it coming from public toilets? Is it coming from institutions, etc.? Which often we don't really know, but collecting each and every truck, you gain that knowledge. And you gain an understanding about what type of system gets empty. Which also includes which system do even exist. So if we send out the trucks, we're like, oh, was there a pit in a septic tank that come back? Oh, this is something completely different, and we haven't really had any knowledge about this. And we also need to do that. And this is in addition to things like estimating markets for treatment and products. We know the quantities that are currently being collected, and we are doing characterization studies. We can estimate markets for end products. Then it provides us knowledge for the operation of existing treatment facilities. If there is a treatment facility, it doesn't always mean they know how much sludge arrives. They might know how much it was designed for, which could be an explanation when treatment plants are actually not performing really well. And to plan and design appropriate future treatment facilities. So now I'm getting over to Kampala. And um, the first thing to do, and this has again to do with like, what I talked about, feeding such volumes, feeding such production, is to do a comprehensive literature research on quantities in that specific city. And to then cross-check this data when you have a look at this judge location, etc., to see what is the reality. So this is what we had in hand in Kampala, very comprehensive sanitation master plan outlined for 30 years. It's been a lot of work into that, Krishna water and um, transportation has produced a report in 2008 that has shown me these figures. So again, you see at the top, the sludge collection is green, volumes are blue, production is orange. And the particular number I was interested in in this case, because we didn't really have the resources to check volumes and production, was this 2013 that was telling me it's 370 meter per day. So now I have this here again. I was like, okay, let's figure out what's happening in Kampala, into the treatment plant. And we figured out there are official records. And there's official record keeping, and the average quantity that was recorded there is 250, so quite a bit less. But that might just be the problem of the engineers that wrote that report, so they didn't really future project right how much treatment sludge is actually being collected. After that, I started talking to Jafari, the owner of the, uh, the leader of the private entities association, and he told me how many trucks they have, how many trips per day. I'm sure a lot of you guys have, all, have done that before in other cities. And what he had told me, from his numbers is that we have 444, which is double as much as the official records, and quite a bit higher than what the, what the projections were. So we could have been satisfied with that and be like, yeah, it's between like 150, 400, but we weren't really, so we decided to implement the truck counting stuff. And this is the next step after doing all that work before, is implementing the truck counting study, and this is what we did with the local association. So this is our result. We did it for two weeks. We had about on average 110 trips per day. And this is not an absolute number, what I'm showing here most definitely. It's always questionable, do you get the right data, do you fill out the question right? We try to take care of that very properly. But what it shows is that both weeks are very similar. So we had been quite confident in this number that was shown over two weeks that it's 577. Instead of 400 that we calculated, instead of 360 being projected, and so on. But what this has shown us is for the future treatment plant that was planned in Kampala, this was already 50% more than it was designed for. So we could inform the local associate, the local utilities, that we have some figures that might show the moment that the treatment plant opens, it might be under the line. What it also shown us for Kampala, this was one of the first surprises or an interesting result is that actually only two out of 111 trips per day were unlike pets. While in Kampala, there is actually the majority of people using unlike pets. So there's several reasons for that. We are looking into trying to figure out what's definitely one of them that mechanical emptiness. You know, they're afraid that it might collapse, it might not be reachable, the service might not be affordable. But it was still quite an impressive result. And where this two actually comes from, it's from the Great River Water. What people is doing in Kampala, where they're connecting manually. Okay, cool. And another interesting result, and this was actually really interesting, is the fact that half, only half of the sludge that is connected comes from households. All of that other sludge comes from service and institutions, schools, public toilets, companies, etc. And that is actually 
very interesting to us because we absolutely didn't expect that. So what are the lessons learned from our study? The first one is a trifle in studies that is maybe an effective tool to estimate how much fecal sludge is currently being collected. The data has to be treated with care. You need to also treat the data with care in terms of how to communicate it. You don't want to offend anyone. You don't ever want to say, yo, your numbers are wrong or whatever. It's a good estimation. You communicate it in the right way. You can have a good impact. A trichomic study can only be performed if we have strong collaborations. No, we can have my presentation. This is definitely the one point where we can do it. Um, in Kampala, only 50% of the sludge comes from households. I just presented the results. And online pits in Kampala are not getting emptied by mechanical emptying and transport companies. And rather the menu. So what we figured is that there's definitely further research needed, specifically on the last two points, to identify the unserved areas in Kampala, and by then figure out the demand for figures that are emptying in the future. Because those are the people that are demanding the emptying that are not getting emptied right now. Good. So I quickly just want to say thank you. The funding was through SDC, and uh, obviously there have been a lot of partners. This is on the slide. You can find these slides online, by the way. I've shared them through my LinkedIn account. And um, especially these guys, they made it possible. And if you have any questions, <laughs> I'm happy to answer. Research has been published in the chapter 
9, Amazon has a management book, very popular book, so you can find more details in this book as well. So this is the general context that critical search management is often lacking during the scientific planning. That's why tons, thousands and tons of critical search is dumped on treated and on controlling into the environment. The major challenges include maintaining transportation storage and treatment, safe disposal and reuse. But particularly safe storage treatment is the most challenging part. Uh, Sometimes there is a uh, practice of discharging clusters in the uh, municipal wastewater treatment plant, particularly in the wastewater treatment plant. But the data is very limited and we don't know what's happening to the that treatment plant after we discharge uh, the untreated clusters into the system. So basically we have three main research questions. The first one is, is it possible to put treatment clusters in an activated uh, slash treatment plan, and if yes, how much fecal slash can be added before it fails, and what are the effects on aeration capacity, inflame or concentration, and cetera. So the main objective is to evaluate and propose key consideration of fecal slash for treatment with activity slash treatment plan. So methodology, we need a mathematical modeling of the effect of discharge of fecal slurs under state, state, state and dynamic condition using a bio-wind simul simulator and after that we also did some fractionation of uh, organic contents uh, and total nitrogen, uh, total uh, COD and total nitrogen in terms of their biodegradability and uh, biodegradability of fecal slurs highly depends upon uh, how long it has been stored in the containment, uh, that's why we put like fresh fecal slurs versus digested fecal slurs. Fresh is more from both uh, public toilets and bucket that, that drains, and digested is more from uh, septic tanks and pit tanks. So this is the methodology, fractionation, and digested and fresh fecal slurs, different volume of fecal slurs combined with wastewater. Uh, we, need, uh, we have a model of conventional aquarium slurs plan. And then we combine, um, we did modeling of combined discharge of wastewater with filter in the uh, aquarium system using power simulator and two conditions, uh, two simulations, steady state simulation and dynamic or digested and phase filter slurs. And at the end, we did the data analysis, measure finding and recommendation we have made. So, uh, based on our literature review, uh, we found that. Uh, there are two, two types of slurs, yeah, uh, fresh and uh, digested uh, fecal slurs, and we categorize, we further categorize it into high strength, medium strength, and low strength based on total COD con concentration and total nitrogen con concentration. So fractionation, biodegradable COD fraction in fresh fecal slurs is uh, around 84 percent. Whereas biodegradable CO2 fraction for digestive fecal cell is relatively low compared to fresh fecal cell is 43%. So this is the uh, biowind uh, model uh, for the activity uh, slurs plant. And in this uh, we have a, a wastewater flow rate of 20,000 meter cube per day, <coughs> that is about 100,000 PE. And the inflame total COD is 750, total nitrogen is 60, total phosphorus is 50. But in this study, we really want to consider total COD and total nitrogen uh, concentration. So, amount of fecal slurs uh, that we that has been added to the plant, uh, it uh, varies from zero, that is without fecal slurs, to 10 percent. Yeah, 10 percent means uh, 2,000 meter cube per day. And the key performance in indicator includes the inflame standard, uh, that is total COD 125 mg per liter, total nitrogen 15 mg per liter, and TSS 35 mg per liter. And the reactor TSS concentration should be less or equal to 6 kg TSS per liter. And we also consider aeration capacity and uh, cost of aeration. So, some of the findings. 
we can see uh, the the inflate inflate quality of total total COD increases proportionally with volume of fecal cells discharged into the system. Particularly in the high strain fecal cells, you can see there is a gradual increase. Yeah. But in, in case of low strain, uh, it is stable. And same thing is happening in the total nitrogen case. Gradually, it, it increases proportionally to the volume of fecal cells discharged into the system. And our limit is 50. So even uh, adding less than one percent of fecal cells, it crosses the limit of 15 mg per liter. So for the infinite TSS, also you can see higher strain of fresh fecal cells. It, it is uh, increasing proportionally with the volume of fecal cells we dump into the system. And the limit is 35 mg per liter. And even after discharge of two, less than 2% of fecal cells, it shows a negative impact to the system. Uh, this is total suspended solid in aeration tank. The limit is should be less than 6 kg TSS per meter cube. And after the discharge of less than 1% of fecal cells, particularly high strain fecal cells, uh, it shows the TSS is more than 6 kg per uh, uh, TSS per meter cube. So, this is the conclusion of the steady state simulation. So, according to this study, so if we want to dump, for example, low strain digestive slurs, then we can, we can have 150 trucks per day if the truck volume is 5 meter cube. And if it is fresh fecal slurs with high strain, only 5 trucks per day can be dumped into the system. <coughs> and uh, in this graph, uh, we can obviously see that uh, as, as the volume of fecal slurs is increased, the requirement, aeration requirement also increase uh, significantly. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, high strength phase fecal slurs, it is up to like 300 percentage requirement. So, it obviously, aeration is uh, related to cost because in activity slurs plant, uh, aeration is the main component in the biological reactor. So, if we calculate the cost, and if we are using high aeration efficiency, then there is an increase of cost uh, by 25% if the fecal cells is high strain and fresh fecal cell. In case of high strain digested uh, fecal cell, the increase in cost per year is 13%. And we also did dynamic sim simulation and we took the average discharge of uh, fecal cells. Uh, 127.1 with 0.668 percentage, and this molding shows that high strain digestive slurs every time. This is the limit for the COD 125 mg per liter, and this is the limit for the total nitrogen. In all cases, it is over the limit, and in case of low strain digestive slurs. Uh, COD is fine because it is under the limit and uh, both COD and T, total nitrogen concentration is under the limit. So low strain digestion fecal cells is fine with this simulation. And in case of low strain fecal cells, the COD level is below the limit so it is fine. Uh, however, the total nitrogen concentration is uh, above the limit so total nitrogen cannot be removed. So we, we did several attempts to improve the inflate quality because uh, we did uh, molding dis by discharging uh, of fecal cells during the night because during the night the volume of wastewater is low and we also combined discharge of fecal cells and inflate wastewater uh, by constructing uh, by, by following uh, equalization tank and discharge in lower volume of fecal cells in the plant, uh, plant but there is no significant improvement or changes in the system. So conclusion is, if the fresh fecal slurs is there and the, uh, it, it is high state fresh fecal slurs, only one truck per day can be loaded into the system. 
So tell your conclusion. Uh, there is high increase in insulin, uh, COD, uh, total matrix and TSS, but low step frequency loss has low impact. There is obvious uh, increase in aeration requirement and increase in uh, total suspended solid in aeration time. No significant improvement has been improved. Uh, if we discharge frequency in the night or by adding uh, flow equalization time, so we can conclude that the uh, dumping the frequency loss into the activities uh, slurs, uh, treatment plan is not a feasible approach. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge UNESCO IC, Gates Foundation, Info, and many more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Of the fecal sludge 
and also for the design of future toilet facilities. Another part of my study was to investigate the fecal flat characteristics at the different dips and the different sections of each of the facilities that were in um, This is similar to the slide that Tina showed. I'll be looking at the dry VIP, which we empty in different, in different sections. The front section, which is under the pedestal, and um, the back section. We also look at the weight VIP and uh, the urine diversion toilet, which was empty. Um, samples from the active bulb that was being used, and samples from the inactive bulb, which was um, currently under decomposition. So the fecal sludge characteristic that I will um, present to you the moisture content, water cell solids, the ammonia, TKN, pH, um, and some of the thermal properties, like thermal conductivity and the heat capacity. So firstly, these are the results for all the VIPs. These are represent the average value across all the pits that we empty. So for the dry value, we had 10, we had 10 um, pits that we empty for each of the different on-site sanitation facilities. And these go per layer. So this is the surface layer, and this is the, the bottom layer of the pit. So uh, for the moisture content, there was a, in the dry VIPs, is a decrease in moisture in the fecal sludge from the surface to the bottom of the pit. While for um, the wet VIPs, we found that the moisture content stayed relatively constant um, within the pit. Um, and then we did the volatile solids. These represent the organic fraction of the total solids in the pit. And again, overall, there was an increase from the surface of the pit to the bottom, which is expected because at the surface, the more fresher um, fecal sludge hasn't undergone as much stabilization as the fecal sludge at the bottom of the pit. Um, another test that we um, performed for the dry VIPs was to compare if the properties in the front section are significantly different to those properties at the back section of the pit. For, the, for both the moisture content and the volatile solids, we found that um, these properties are significantly different between the front and the back section. Um, moving on to the ammonia content, for the wet VIPs, we found to have the least ammonia content as compared to the dry VIPs, but again, there was also a decrease in the property between the surface and the bottom of the pit. Um, and it, for the dry VIPs, we found that there was no significant difference between the front section and mm. the back section. Mm. Similarly, for the TK, oh, the back section of the dry VIP was found to have similar TKN con contents with that of the wet VIPs. Um, we also found that there was no significant difference between the front and the back section of, of the dry VIP. Mm. Then moving on to the thermal properties, first we have on the left the thermal conductivity. Um, this didn't change very significantly between um, the different types of facilities and also within the facility from the top to the bottom of the bed. In fact, um, the range, the average range was between um, 0.52 and 0.56 um, watts per meter Kelvin. And um, the heat capacity was found that There wasn't a significant difference between um, the front and the back section of the dry VIPs, and also from the range from um, 2,300 to about 2,800 um, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. 
So uh, moving on to the results for the urine diversion toilet, these are presented in the different layers. These are the different results that we sample and the layers. Um, first, with the moisture content, I compared the moisture content found in the vaults with that of um, feces, which is a dotted line at 0.74 um, grams per gram liter. So as you can see for the urine diversion toilet, there were only a few, these three, that had um, a moisture content, they had all the sludge in the pit in the vault and a moisture content less than that of the Again, look, we look, I look also at the ammonia content of the same urine diversion toilet because um, the ammonia is introduced into the fecal sludge via the urine components of the excreta. So for the same uh, urine diversion 567, we found that this fecal sludge had no ammonia in it. When I look at the pH of the fecal sludge in the urine diversion toilet, again, the, the pH of those three had um, a lower pH, which is consistent with the pH of the so from all of these conclusions, um, you could see that out of the 10 urine diversion toilets that we sample, only the three were acting accordingly with the urine and the feces were diluted at the source. So what happened then is that we compared those properties, the different properties of um, those urine diversion toilets that were actually um, operating accordingly. But from what we saw between the surface and the bottom is that for some of the of the balls that are in UD6, all the properties decrease from the surface to the bottom of the ball, while for UD7, all the properties increase from um, the surface to the bottom of the wall. So, because we had only three um, urine diversion toilets in the study that were operating accordingly, we couldn't make clear conclusions as to how the sludge actually um, changes between the top and the bottom of the field. But also, um, another thing to note is that. The characteristics of the fecal sludge in the urine diversion toilet are much lower than that of the found in the ventilation ventilation. So, um, in conclusion, with regards to the sampling of the dry VIP, for most of the properties, it was found that there was no significant difference between the front and the back of section of the pit. So, um, if yeah, so that is yeah, so that is not required and it was not deemed necessary for most of the properties. And um, it was found that the people's sketch characteristics between the dry and the wet VIP were uh, pretty similar. For the urine diversion toilet, um, we can use the moisture content, the ammonia and the pH to determine if the toilet is being used accordingly and this can be used to support the visual observation on the site. And based on the different characteristics between the urine diversion sludge and the VIP sludge, uh, different metric, treatment methods need to be um, implemented for these types of facilities. Divided the pits 
<laughs> front station and the back station, and um, it's a different thing. So the sampling occurred during a manual um, MC program, so all the slides of the, in the pit was being taken out. So we measured the different bits while they're taking out the slides and take samples and predetermine the patient. <laughs> but um, we'll be explaining that the website. Things. 
And uh, this table shows the uh, main characteristic of the food spread compared to the figures last week in our laboratory design. Uh, as we can see that uh, the, uh, the main in the food spread have the high concentrations of carbonate, uh, carbonate cont uh, content or organic content compared to the uh, figures last uh, while lower of uh, total, uh, total nitrogen. And 90% of the DS content of the food, uh, food waste is um, uh, so, uh, volatilized. Um, uh, so this um, waste. So we try to um, to uh, combinations of um, the two substrates in the anaerobic digestion. So the main uh, objective of our research is firstly to emulate the digestibility of the fetal slug and food spread under the lead conditions. Secondly, to optimize the process, and finally, we try to estimate the potential energy recover from the process in a specific way. We can apply the calculations in the one district in Vietnam. So, uh, our research methodology is uh, this uh, the feature shows the, the stream of the, um, the scheme of the, uh, the pilot scale. Uh, the food waste uh, has been uh, uh, almost been uh, blended and wound with which get the figure slash and uh, pumped into the anaerobic digestion. The anaerobic digestion has a working volume of uh, one cubic meter and operated under the thermobilic condition. Um, uh, here is the uh, anaerobic digester and the biogas well, was produced from the anaerobic we pour, measure, in and measures. Uh, the value of the gas composition is also analyzed by the analyzer. And all the system will automatically control and monitor by the PC, the system. And this slide shows the main characteristics of the feeding material, uh, material the figures glass and the food waste. And the ratio uh, we uh, Apply with the ratio of the figure slide and food weight is one to one in volume. And uh, in the best mode of the uh, pilot experiment, we start with the uh, 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 VS content is uh, around 30 kilogram per liter, up to cubic meter. And our uh, results. Uh, this picture shows the uh, accumulated volume <coughs> of biogas and methane uh, produced from the uh, digester within 70 days of operation time. And uh, uh, the same below picture shows the uh, concentrations of COD and VAS, uh, VSS of the digested slash over the time. As you can see, that um, uh, the COD and the VAS decrease over the time due to the fact that the content will convert to the, the biogas or maybe the, the methane. And uh, we had the uh, fact, we were suspected that the, the, the actual uh, volume of biogas was uh, nearly similar to the, uh, the theoretical ones. And we have the uh, remarkable uh, removal efficiencies in terms of COD and PAS in the batch mode. And this uh, figure shows the impact of the pH uh, of the um, sludge in the digester to the uh, to the methane productions. Uh, and we can see that uh, in the first uh, two weeks, the, B, uh, the pH is lower than uh, for four to five, so we have no methane uh, in the biogas. But when we adjust uh, by sodium, sodium bicarbonate and sodium uh, carbonate to the uh, pH around 6 to uh, 7, so, uh, we have the good and stable percentages of the methane in the biogram. And this uh, figure shows the gas composition uh, in the digester. And we can see that um, we have very low oxygen uh, concentrations, so the anaerobic uh, conditions were assured. Uh, the um, segments of um, uh, reflections between the percentage uh, 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 of methane and CO2 from the, uh, uh, in the gas, uh, biogas uh, through the horizontal lines, it means that we have the uh, correlations between the methane uh, 
using the hydrogen and methane using the acid base. And uh, next is about the, uh, we try to, uh, to uh, you know, look inside the nutrient element uh, in, the, um, in the digester and we show that over the time uh, the seems uh, when we have the stable uh, percentage of methane <coughs> metal bar, when we have the, the, the ratio of CV to titanium uh, nitrogen is about 50 to 70 and the COD uh, to the full fast, uh, to the full fast is around 20. So it would be the suitable uh, balance um, the nutrients uh, yeah, for the uh, digester. And the second is uh, we run uh, the pilot uh, uh, model in the continuous mode. Uh, the, the we, uh, we try to the different uh, mission ratio with the figure slot and foot rate is uh, 9 to 1 in volume. Well, the strategy is increasing the hydrogen loading rate and organic loading rate in the digester. And this table shows the main characteristic of the mission. And this feature shows the uh, uh, biogas production rate uh, from, the, uh, from the reactor uh, with different space, uh, with different organic loading rate all the time. And we can see that when we increase the organic loading rate, we have increasing the volume of the biogas produced from the reactor. However, the percentage of uh, the methane is decreasing. And we couldn't uh, surface with the organic loading rate of 2 kg of COD per cubic meter per day. Continuous mode, we show the, uh, the uh, characteristic of the digestive slash. I mean, you can see from the table uh, the heavy edge of the digestive slash after the hybrid return to time of fire or for the top with the guidelines and also the heavy metal of the Vietnamese standard. So, uh, this digestive, uh, digestive slash is uh, quite good for the soil enrichment. Finally, uh, the, we uh, try to apply the, our research results for the, uh, in the case study uh, uh, we uh, calculate in the Lumpia district in Hanoi and this feature just shows the current san uh, sanitation system in Lumpia district and we can see that most uh, of the safety slash we both uh, stimulate uh, the spontaneous deliver discharge to the dumping side of the dish a small or very small part of the composting. So this feature just uh, show the uh, our, uh, our idea about the integrated waste streams uh, in the complex of um, um, septic tanks, that's also the wastewater and the organic uh, part in the solid waste go to the complex and uh, all the sludge and um, um, sewage can go to the thermal and then we digest it for reduce my gas. Okay, we, we just need to come to the conclusion. Yes. Um, And this is the final um, result of our conclusion. When we have uh, put into the uh, different uh, waste stream, the uh, slot in the wastewater treatment plant, the food waste and figure slot, uh, co digesters into the thermophilic and the digestion, we have the uh, uh, remarkable biogas produ production rate of our um, uh, 19 to 20 cubic of biogas per ton of waste, and we have the uh, energy surplus. So that uh, is also the number of the total energy surplus uh, in the scale of the trees. So we go to the conclusion. Uh, we just uh, have to, to say that the figure slab and the bush weight could be the 
uh, idol world, uh, composition, uh, uh, combinations of modern and aerobic digestion. This, uh, this thing about the balance of the nutrient element, also the missing ratio. Uh, in the best mode and in the continuous mode, we have the uh, good, uh, the uh, uh, CMD and DS, we move efficiencies. Also, uh, we found the uh, so good uh, balance nutrients between the CMD, nitrogens, and nitrogens, and phosphorus for stable methane uh, production in the biogas. And also, the uh, the optimum, or uh, maybe the uh, the optimum uh, uh, organic loading waste for the stable operation in the continuous mode. And uh, uh, we have the uh, uh, energy surface from the uh, co digestion of liquid waste stream increase of the uh, um, one dishes in uh, Vietnam. And finally, uh, we could state that the thermophilic and aerobic co digestion of vegan slug food and um, it could be the solutions to integrate waste management and sanitation in urban planning. Finally, okay, we I, think, I think we need to really conclude with this. It's also fair for the other presenters. And if you want to have a question, you can just. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Okay.
if you could think about any specific outputs of this very interesting session. I have some ideas, but I would be interested to listen to you. And then we, we can go to this. Yeah, go on with your question. <laughs> Regarding uh, the track counting method, uh, I have a question about the track counting method. Uh, just, just a quick question. Uh, when uh, you're counting all the track numbers, and then the hands up, it's not just that the tracks are full. Is there any reason to suspect that that not the case always? Top full tracks or something like that? So, uh, thanks for your question. And it's excellent, this is why I said you always need to take these numbers with care. And out of all these questionnaires, we have asked the truck driver as well if the truck is full. We know that's not always reliable. But at the same time, most of the trucks in Kampala have been engaged at the end. So you can see how full the truck is. And it's in almost 100% of the cases, obviously not always, but that we could see it's about the gauge which indicates the truck was full. Someone else? Yeah. Someone at the back, yeah. Hello, I am uh, Elijah Mogul Sobo from Senegal. I have a question for Mrs. William. Uh, I learned in slide number 12 that he, she is testing the influence of nutrients on biogas production. And uh, I saw that he measured the COD, TP, and uh, COD. And ratios. I just want to know if he made uh, several doses of these nutrients or if she followed just the evolution of these parameters during the digestion. Thank you for the questions. There are several reasons for that. First, uh, about the 
the climate condition that we had in Indonesia, the, uh, the temperature that we had uh, compared with the previous, the international studies quite high. That's the first thing. And the second one, regarding the, the content of the sludge itself, which is, we found that it is less rubbish, it's only the sludge, the, 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 this, the liquid uh, without no sludge, although some of the place we found the menstruational uh, product, but not as much as we found from the other uh, international studies. What about the structure of septic tanks? Do you think about the difference of the structure, design, septic tanks? We found that most of the design of uh, our our onsite sanitation is is a single pit. So so because of that, not variation on the on the design. We don't we don't think that uh, the decoration did that. Okay. With that, I would like to thank you for the questions. And the next hand, I would like to be hired to be to tell us about what's the important output or takeaway message you would take from this session. Any volunteer? I'm sure you have learned a lot. So I would like to summarize some points. Is that? Of course, we have a big difference, and also when we talk about figure sludge, we need to be very cautious what we talk about, because figure sludge is actually very different if you take a dry VIP, and if, even if you take different VIPs, depending how they are operated. But if you take not a VIP, a urine diversion toilet, or a septic tank, this is an important difference you need to take into account when designing. That's the side of characteristics. But then you know how, what is in your sludge. You also need to know how much sludge you, you have of each type of different characteristics. So that's an important point to take home, I think. But any of you is welcome to compliment. Yeah, I see one hand, courageous hand. <laughs> So what do you say we learn a lot about this presentation? And how, how, what do you see the effect of that is very different between country and maybe in the same country? And for the go flow of uh, higher research, maybe you can want to do standards that maybe the better and people want maybe to work a lot of in this area, just maybe to how to can compare maybe this result. I say I do my results in Senegal and I use my method or my method. You can use your, your only metal making there now. The result can be very different. This decide you do not use the same metal. I think you you will need to go deeper and be standard that measure for collection or to quantify standards and stuff that they also for the quantify things. So you may find what I can say in the structure. Thank you, that's a great contribution. So actually, methods are very important, and when you give results of characteristics, it's also important to tell how you how you put the samples, where and which kind of pit it was in. My point is where they're very short, this I think it is based on Lars's experience. Never take, never accept other people's estimates of sludge quantities. Okay, <laughs> so trust yourself. <laughs> Anyone else for the last contribution? One more. I would just say in general I got a lot out of the session and how what people were doing in different countries, but the overall result for me was confirming how little we know and how much we have to learn, and then we can't even agree what a set of is. Yeah, okay, thank you. And with that, I would like to thank you all for being here staying a long, longer time in your interest. And thank you again to the presenters who really made very good and interesting presentations. Thank you.